Brothers and sisters, if you and I take a moment and rotate our gaze across the entire globe, quickly we will identify that the planet has become gripped into unprecedented turmoil. From political turbulence to economic instability, social mayhem, anarchy, lawlessness, and the list continues to grow every single day. While this sad state of our planet may often at times result in sobbing, complaining, and loss of hope, the English proverb said, complaining about darkness doesn't help, but lighting a candle does. Complaining about darkness doesn't help, but lighting a candle does. And I think that in itself is a focal point of my discussion with you this afternoon. In other words, what is it that you and I can do as individuals that will have a ripple impact in the lives of others and introduce a positive change in the world of tomorrow? And here is an amazing example for you and I to benefit from. The great Khalifa Umar ibn al-Khattab was once about to conduct one of his weekly addresses. And he rotates his entire gaze across the entire room and identifies that a specific individual was missing. So he asks in regards to the whereabouts of this person and a man from the back of the room stands up and says, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the person you are inquiring about has developed a drinking habit. In other words, he has become an alcoholic. And therefore, he has become a rather nuisance. He has become a pain in the rear end. So why don't you forget about him? And why don't you pretend as though he doesn't exist? And focus on all of us who are here, eager in wanting to learn from you. So Umar ibn Khattab said, excuse me? Do you not realize that we are speaking about one of our very own brethren? And if he has defected and fallen off the radar, is it not our responsibility? Is it not our job? Is it not our duty to do whatever we can within our ability to bring this person back onto track? So then Umar ibn Khattab sits down and gives the matter some thought and he decides to write a letter to this individual. And he says to him in this letter that we are about to conduct our weekly address and you are absent. And it will never be the same without you. In other words, he's making him feel important. And then he adds at the bottom of the letter, the verse from Surah Ghafir, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself in a very peculiar manner. La ilaha illa huwa ilayhi al-masir. I am the Lord Almighty, Allah says. The one who accepts repentance, the forgiver of sins, stern of punishment. There is none worthy of worship except me. To me shall be your return. Umar radiallahu anh then tasks an envoy and says to him, give this note to so and so under two conditions. Number one, you must give it to him personally. In other words, if you don't see him, then don't give this note to someone and say, No. Why? Because we as a Muslim community by nature are very nosy. Someone may open that note and this person's sad state of his of reality may become the gossip of the community. Umar radiallahu anh didn't want this because God forbid if this had happened, perhaps this person may have never changed his life. And the second condition was you give him this note when he is sober, when he's able to read it and understand the message that consists within this note. So it wasn't a lousy text message that often at times it's sent out to the members of the community, but rather it was a letter full of worry and concern. When the envoy had left, Umar radiallahu anh had turned to everyone in the, uh, that were present and he said to them, we are not going to continue with the theme of this week's discussion. Rather, I want each and every single one of you to engage in individual dua. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inspire this individual upon receiving my letter. So eventually, When this note of Omar fell on the lap of this individual, 
The man began to read it. He began to introspect. And then he began to cry like a baby. And he said, Umar, I salute your vision. Out of all of the things you could have said to me, you added a verse from the Quran, which on one hand, it is reprimanding and rebuking me, but at the very same time, it is giving me a glimpse of hope. The man that repented and became one of the most rehabilitated youth that Medina had ever seen. Now my brother and sister, if Umar radiallahu had taken the advice of the man who stood up at the back of the room and said, forget about this individual. He is becoming nuisance in the community. Imagine and pretend that he doesn't exist. Then this individual would have fallen down the tubes forever and ever. But look at the power of a little bit of concern. Look at the power of the worry that Umar ibn Khattab had for the well-being and the future of this individual. In fact, it is this very individual who orchestrated and archered the very welfare system that you and I benefit from today under the direction of Umar ibn Khattab The following week, Umar radiallahu said to the people that came to listen to his thoughts, that the lesson to derive from last week's lesson uh, 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 and, and, and address is the following. إِذَا رَأَيْتُمْ أَخَلَّكُمْ زَلَّ زَلَّةً فَسَدِّدُوهُ وَوَثِّقُوهُ وَلَا تَكُونُوا أَعْوَانًا لِلشَّيْطَانِ عَلَيْهِ That when you find one of your very own brethren down in the dumps, when you find one of your brethren whose back is against the wall and they feel as though the entire world is against them, stand up to rescue them. For their collapse is the fall of the entire ummah and rescuing them is the deliverance of the entire ummah. Was it not the Arabic poet who said so amazingly, Sabruka fi musibati khayrun min jaz'ik wa jaz'uka fi musibati akhika khayrun min sabrik. It is better for you to persevere over your own pain and agony than for you to moan and groan. And it is better for you to moan and groan over the pains of others than for you to persevere and turn a blind eye. Sabruka fi musibati khayrun min jaz'ik wa jaz'uka fi musibati akhika khayrun min sabrik. It is better for you, my brother and sister, to persevere over your own pain and agony than for you to moan and groan. And it is better for you to moan and groan over the pains of others than for you to persevere. Today, tragically, over the most trivial of matters, over the most simple of inflictions, we want to make an abundant amount of noise. We want to mobilize our resources. Why? Because my rights have been violated and infringed upon. But I am dead silent at the pain and the agony of my fellow brothers and sisters, whether it be here, in this country, or internationally. Yet, if this perception that I could persevere over my own pain and agony, but it bothers me and it hurts me to see my brother and sister going through some trials and tribulations, some triumph, so some, some, some form of, of difficulties, then this perception alone will bring about an immediate change within our community. And this is not just for the Muslims, but by extension, humanity in itself. And what better example to shed light upon than that of an individual who devoted, practically speaking, his entire life to providing aid to the poor. He was a philanthropist, a social worker, an aid giver, a humanitarian, and I'm referring to none other than Abdul Sattar Eidi. At the age of 28, he embarked on a mission. And for the next 60 years, day and night, he would make it a point to provide some form of aid to those that were in need. In the hopes of introducing a positive change in the world of tomorrow, starting with himself. He didn't rely on anyone else. He didn't rely on any other organization. He took it upon himself. And Allah turned his efforts into an entire organization. Single-handedly. 
single-handedly, he provided aid for hundreds and thousands of individuals. Twenty thousand abandoned infants were helped by him. He rescued them. Fifty thousand orphans were rehabilitated. Forty thousand nurses were educated and trained. And he ran the world's largest ambulance fleet, consisting of one hundred fifty uh, fifteen thousand. Ambulances operating on a daily base. And not just that, but even on his deathbed. Even on his deathbed, he said to his family members that sat around him, the only organs that are operating well are my eyes. The only organs in my body that are operating well are my eyes. So I want you to take these eyes and give them to a deserving person. The man had devoted 60 years of his life providing aid to those that were in need. He opened hundreds if not thousands of shelters, emergency rooms, hundreds and thousands of soup kitchens. And even on his deathbed, he said, let me continue this act of charity. Whatever you give in the path of Allah, it will only be to your benefit. Allah says, and whatever you give in charity for the sake of Allah, it will be given back to you. And I want no one. So even on his deathbed, my brother and sister, he said, take these eyes of mine and give them to someone who is deserving of them. And today there is someone walking on the streets with his eyes, with the ability to see. Allah says, verily, we will resurrect the dead. And... We record your actions that you have sent forward so that you may give a detailed accountability for them. But most imperatively, most essentially, we record the traces of your actions that you will leave behind once you leave this world. So ask yourself, my brother and sister, what are you leaving behind in this world when you will depart? There's a pair of eyes on the body of someone that is reading and reciting the Quran, that perhaps at some point will see the beautiful Kaaba and pray to the Lord Almighty. All of that is being accredited to this individual. The word athar in this ayah refers to traces or even footsteps that will continue to survive and show up later, even after you have passed away. As long as your contributions continue bearing fruit, you will continue to acquire that reward long after you have died. The Prophet wasallam was reported to have said in a hadith upon the revelation of this ayah, مَنْ سَنَّ سُنَّةً حَسَنَةً فَلَهُ أَجْرُهَا وَأَجْرُ مَنْ عَمِلَ بِهَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ مِنْ غَيْرِ أَنْ يُنْقَصَ مِنْ أُجُورِهِمْ شَيْئًا that you will have the reward of the good that you do and the good that you introduce. But also you will have the reward of those who act in accordance with the good that you do and introduce. Without the slightest decrease in the reward of those who are acting upon it. So imagine the hundreds, if not the thousands of individuals that have been guided at the hands of this individual. That have been helped and assisted at the hands of this individual. All of that reward is being accredited to this person. What are you willing to do in your life? So that you can be benefited in the hereafter. The man, he owned only two pair of clothes. Two pair of clothes. When one was dirty, he would put it in the wash and he'll wear the other. And he would wash his own clothes. Even up until the time that he became old and weak. It was only when he was unable to move and function, he would ask his family members to wash his clothes for him. He never even hired someone, nor did he even take a single penny from the relief entity that was created from his very own palms. Truly a person to be inspired by. 
The Huffington Post wrote about him before he passed. That he indeed was the greatest living humanitarian in our era. He was indeed the greatest living humanitarian in our era. The nation would refer to him as the angel of mercy. And he was known as Father Teresa. The nation would revere him and they would say that he is known as the angel of mercy among us and Father Teresa. But my brother and sister, this is how the world recognized him. I want you to for a moment ask yourself, how will Allah recognize this individual? For the nobility that he conducted, for the gentleness that he exhibited, for the generosity that he displayed, how will Allah recognize this individual? For you to contextualize it, let me share with you the story of the very uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Lahab. He was one day sitting at home and in comes his slave girl, Thuwayba. And she says, Master, I bring to you good news. I bring to you glad tidings. Amina, the wife of your late brother Abdullah, has just given birth to Muhammad, your nephew. This made him overwhelmed with joy and excitement. And he got off his chair and he said, Thuwayba, because you have brought this good news to me, I have freed you. You are no longer a slave girl from this moment onwards. Take this sack of gold coins and do as you wish. She said, my master, I know you to be a despicable individual. You may need to sleep over this matter for a moment or two because I know tomorrow you will change your mind. He says, no, absolutely not. From the bottom of my heart, sincerely, this is a good deed that I am performing. Time passes by, decades move on. His nephew, upon whose birth Abu Lahab had rejoiced, became the best of humans and the prophet of God. And Abu Lahab himself became a despicable enemy of Islam and did everything in his power and might to throw dirt on the mission of the Prophet ﷺ. You are all familiar with this story and the incident. He passes away. And the hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. He comes in the dream of the other uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Abbas. And he's asked, مَا فَعَلَ اللَّهُ بِكَ Abu Lahab, you had lived a horrendous life on earth. Every chance you got, you tried to persecute and pester the Muslims. Now that you have passed on, what is your affair before Allah? He said, to be a very frank, I'm going through a horrendous circumstance. I'm going through some harsh torment. But every week I look forward to Monday. So he's asked, what is so significant? About Monday, why are you looking forward to Monday of every week? He said, Monday was the day my nephew was born, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And upon hearing the news of the birth of my nephew, I did something out of the goodness of my heart. I freed my slave girl, Thuwayba. And this was the practice of the Arabs once upon a time. When they would hear good news, they would return that with a gift. And there couldn't be a better gift for Thuwayba than her freedom. He says, because of this, Allah reduced my punishment marginally in the hereafter. In the commentary of this hadith, the poet writes, إِذَا كَانَ هَذَا كَافِرًا جَاءَ ذَمُّ بِتَبَّتْ يَدَاهُ بِالْجَحِيمِ مُخَلَّدًا أَتَى أَنَّهُ فِي الْيَوْمِ الْأَثْنَيْنِ دَائِمًا يُخَفَّفُ عَنَّهُ لِلسُّرُورِ بِأَحْمَدًا فَمَا ظَنُّ بِالْعَبْدِ الَّذِي كَانَ عُمْرُ بِأَحْمَدًا that indeed the man was a despicable enemy of Allah. He did everything wrong in his life. The only good deed he did was he freed his slave girl Thuwayba upon the birth of his nephew Muhammad sallallahu As a result of which Allah marginally reduced his punishment in the hereafter. So how about you and I as a believer living our lives diligently in accordance with to the practice of Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam and dying upon that, what would be our status in the hereafter? What would be our status in the hereafter? So, my brother and sister, you could just imagine the status, the maqam of this individual, 
Abdul Sattar Aidi before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't come to the aid of one or two individuals. He rescued 20,000, 20,000 infants. Rehabilitated 50,000 orphans. And yet the Prophet ﷺ said, when you come to the aid and assistance of an orphan, you will be with me like this on Yawm al That's one. 50,000. I want you to reflect on that for a moment. I don't think that it was the only the nation that moaned his death, but I truly feel, and excuse me for saying this, that even the angels in the heavens moaned his death. Because think about it for a moment. For 60 years, constantly, consistently, day and night, they were writing his good deeds. He didn't devote and dedicate his life for a week or two, a month or a year or two. 60 years, constantly, day and night, he devoted his life to aid and helping others. The Prophet sallallahu said, uh, uh, he said that your brother is a fellow brethren to you. Al-Muslim wa akhul Muslim. Your brother is a fellow brethren to you. لا يظلمه ولا يسلمه. You do not harm him in any way, nor do you allow him to fall in a predicament through which perhaps he may become harmed. من كان في حاجة أخيه كان الله في حاجة. And if you come to the aid, assistance, and relief of a fellow brother who is in need, then let it be known to you that Allah is going to take it upon Himself to come to your aid and assistance. ومن يسر المعسر يسر الله عليه في الدنيا والآخرة. If you provide aid and assistance and relief to someone who is in need, Allah will not come to your aid and assistance only in this world, but also in the hereafter when we would need it the most. This individual didn't come to the aid of one person, but thousands upon thousands of individuals. So brothers and sisters, ask yourself, what am I willing to do for the sake of others? As I began the khutbah, I said, there are many trials that we are going through. There are many tribulations that we are encountering. But complaining about them wouldn't help. Lighting a candle will. Ask yourself, what am I willing to do to light that very candle? What do I need to do through which change will be introduced in this world? Do not rely on someone. Do it yourself. Talking will not help. Doing is what will help. In fact, Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah was reported to have said, change is like having an itch on the back of your body. Urdu mein isko kehte kujli ho rahi hai. Right? In Pushtu you say, shame karigi. Right? That my back is itching me, it's bothering me, it's aggravating. The medical terminology for this is tinea vesicular. When your back is really bothering you and you, know, you, you don't know what to do with yourself. And you're becoming a, irritated. So you ask your buddy or your spouse, could you please itch my back for me? And they start itching it or scratching it. And you say a little up. No, 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 no. A little right. No, no, no. A little down. No, no, no. A little left. No, no. A little up. No, no, no. A little down. Leave it. I'll do it myself. So Imam Ashafi says, change is like this. If you, if someone cannot satisfy the simple irritation on the back of your body, then why should you and I rely on them for the ultimate and greater change in our society? If someone cannot satisfy the simple irritation on the back of your body, then why should you and I on earth rely on someone else for the ultimate and greater change in society? Think about it. Don't talk and complain about the sad state of our nation, the sad state of this country economically, Emotionally, whatever the case might be, do something. And everyone is gifted in one way or the other. This organization, the Abrahamic Foundation in itself, is doing tremendous work. Step up to the plate and provide your services. If you're good in marketing, then do something in that area. If you're good with talking, then do something in community relations. You have been gifted with something. If Allah has given you wealth, then give a portion of that wealth towards charity. He is an amazing example. 
when I think we're running out of time. Once a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was returning from an expedition and they decided to halt and take some rest. Now understand back then there wasn't any drive through McDonald's, right? So they decided to have a meal and the Prophet of Allah said, Amara bi islahi shaykin. Why don't we slaughter a lamb and have a barbecue? So one of the companions comes running and says, Ya Rasulullah, alayya dhabhuha. I'm going to take it upon myself to slaughter the animal. Another companion comes running and says, Ya Rasulullah, alayya salkhuha. I'm going to take it upon myself to skin the animal. And a third companion comes running and says, Ya Rasulullah, alayya tabkhuha. I'm going to take it upon myself to cook the meal, to prepare it for the people. Now Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa did say to them, well, if that's the case, I'm going to take a chill pill, sit back and just text me when the meal is ready and I'll come and we'll chow together. No. In fact, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said something that every time I'm reminded of it, it gives me goosebumps. It makes the hair on my body stand up. And for a hairy person, that's a very scary scene. <laughs> And being a Pathan on top of that, you can just imagine. He said that if you're going to slaughter the animal and you're going to skin it and you, brother, are going to cook the meal, then alayya jam'ul hatab. Then let me go and collect the firewood and ignite the fire and prepare it for all of you. Allahu Akbar. They say, Nakfiq al amal, ya Rasulullah. Nakfiq al amal, you're embarrassing us. No, no, no. Take a, take a seat, take a chill, we'll sit back, we'll, we'll holla at you. We'll call you when the food is ready. He said something to them that needs to be carved in stone and hanged in every institution of Islam. He said, قَدْ عَلِمْتُ أَنَّكُمْ تَكْفُونِي وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَكْرَهُ مِنْ عَبْدِهِ أَنْ يَرَاهُ مُتَمَيِّزًا بَيْنَ أَصْحَابِهِ He says, my companions, I know very well that you will all do a remarkable job. But Allah dislikes it when a group of individuals finds a need and does something about it whilst the rest only sit back watching to see the outcome. And on the other hand, Allah loves it when we mutually work together, putting our shoulders to the wheel, navigating the way forward. This is a sight that is dear and loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In English, the proverb said something rather remarkable. A community and a society shall grow mighty and great when its members like you and I will plant trees knowing very well we will never ever see them flourish or grow. But all the while we will have a deep conviction that one day a child from the progeny of this ummah will play under the shade of that tree and that perception alone is sufficient for my contentment and happiness. I know there was a little bit of commotion but try to reflect upon this. The poet said, a society and a community shall grow mighty and great when its members like you and I will plant trees knowing very well we will never ever see them flourish or grow but all the while we will have a deep conviction that one day a child from the progeny of this ummah will play in the shade of this tree and that in itself is sufficient for my contentment and happiness. My brother and sister, when this becomes the vision and the building blocks of a community then the destiny of humanity would instantly become different.